Hi, my name is Alex Cassano and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society and today we will be featuring Rui from the St. Petersburg Museum of History. He is the executive director at the Museum of History and today you'll be hearing stories of St. Petersburg. Thank you. All right. Hi. Uh, my name is Rui Frias. I'm the director of the St. Pete Museum of History. Um, it's an honor to be here. I was here actually the, the day that the museum opened and it was, it was exciting to, uh, to have you guys join the, the, the history family, the museum family here in, uh, in uh, Tampa Bay. So we're going to take a little tour. I usually do like, a, I, I do a lot of these for civic clubs and neighborhood associations and we, you know, I, mostly in St. Petersburg but throughout Tampa Bay and I kind of ask like, you know, see what you know about St. Pete. So how many of you are Pinellas County? Born and raised. Oh, good. Okay, that's good. Excuse me. Born in St. Pete. Good for you. All right, um, and that's usually rare. Like, see, what I'm finding strange is like in the, some of the neighborhood associations I speak to, when I ask, like, you know, born and raised, and like one person raises their hand, and and majority of these people have only lived here like five, six, seven, eight years, which is amazing to me because you know the the, the way our population has shifted since after the war. Um, but we're going to take a little journey today with some photos and some stories. Um, I kind of go off, I teach Florida history at St. Pete High in the morning before I head to the museum. So I kind of go off on weird tangents and my students love it because they know that nothing is seriously is going to happen in class that day probably when we start talking about stuff. But they learn things which is important um, along the way. So the picture you're looking at now actually is our first museum. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But when we, took, when we look at the history of our area here, and St. Petersburg especially, St. Petersburg is a peninsula on a peninsula on a peninsula, right? Um, the city's surrounded by, by water on three sides, as is Pinellas County, as is the state of Florida. So we're kind of weird. And one of the first things that I tell my students uh, and I tell folks is that we live in um, a fake city in a fake state. Um, when, you, when you look at, at the history of St. Petersburg and the history of Florida in general, man, the whole thing was built on marketing and promotions. So what does that mean? Lies, right? Um, along the way. So we've, we've had a, a very strange history, a very unique history. Um, and the one thing that uh, we have an artist that is working on uh, a piece of art that will wrap our new build. We're going to have a 10,000 square foot expansion hopefully next year. Um, and she's working on a piece of art that is an abstract of a Florida map that wraps the building. And um, the one thing that she discovered uh, when she was doing all this research on what to do with the art is that everything in the United States, most of our history through our modern history came through Florida. Um, from the arrival of the Spanish to you know, the Apollo missions to the moon and, and you name it, it started here in Florida along the way. So as we all know, it started with these guys. And we don't, um, I don't call them Native Americans. I call them Native Floridians. Uh, and, and the question I always ask people and my students about these Native uh, Floridians is, you know, I, ask them, I ask them to describe the American Indian. And of course, it's teepee, horse, you know, buffalo, and those type of things. I'm just shaking my head. I said, we, we were fortunate to have the original Jimmy Buffett version of Native Americans here in Florida. Uh, a, a lot of our Native tribes lived on the water lived from the water uh, and were the original beach bums in, in Florida. So this is an artist's rendering of what the Togabagan Indians uh, look like. Um, and I've read lots about their lifestyle and they weren't the typical Plains American Indian that followed the buffalo and you know were transient moved from place to place. They built a city um, and cities all throughout what is now Pinellas County uh, with their largest encampment or capital being Safety Harbor um, for that matter. So this is what he thought he looked like and from what I've learned about the Togabagans they have had they had a language, they had a government, they had a military, they had religion um, they had everything that we thought we brought to, you know, that Europeans brought to uh, this land. 
they also thought that they could live for a thousand years in Tampa Bay because of the number of fish that were in Tampa Bay, that they could survive off of that. And they had a huge trading system. We found out that they've traded as far west as Alabama and then as far north, I guess, around the state of Florida to Georgia. Um, so they, they traded with, with other uh, Native Americans along the way. And everything was fine and dandy, right, until these guys showed up. Right, so there goes the neighborhood. Um, with the arrival of the Spanish, first with Juan Ponce de Leon and all the others that followed um, throughout the state of Florida, it, it changed everything uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, and a lot of people, um, you know, think that the Spaniards came through, you know, with their swords and their, you know, their muskets and their cannons and wiping out the native population. But most of them are wiped out by disease um, rather than the sword. Although they, you know, they 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 did you know, massacre their share. Yeah, their fair share of them um, along the way. But there's all kinds of conversations about the arrival of the Spaniards and, and where they landed and, you know, that type of thing. Um, and everybody knows that, you know, Juan's first voyage uh, in 1513 landed on the east coast of Florida. They don't know exactly where. Three cities claim that he landed there. Of course, St. Augustine with the biggest marketing budget claims, you know, they landed there. Um, on the west coast of Florida, um, Juan met his d demise here on his second voyage, but there's always been this discussion um, on the, uh, the, uh, the landing site of a number of, of these explorers, um, like one by the name of Narvaez. And if you drive down Park Street in St. Petersburg, um, near about 16th or 18th Avenue North, you're going to see this sign uh, on Park Street that you know sa says, "On this site in 1528, landed Panfilo Narvaez, the first inland expedition of the United States by the white man, and also the first introduction of an African slave to what is now the United States." Um, it's a pretty amazing sign, and if you can believe that sign, and I wish we could prove that sign is correct that means we are the birthplace of the united states not you know jamestown or any of these other not saint augustine here right in in uh, pinellas county in saint petersburg the problem is you you can't you, you can't prove it directly um and this has been the fun part of like my job the last few years at the Museum of History is, is I've dealt with a number of historians, professors uh, like Dr. Michael Francis at USF, who is the utmost you know, expert on Spanish colonial Florida, um, and, uh, and some other historians who have differing opinions. Um, there's a gentleman in St. Petersburg who spent a tremendous amount of time and resources um, hiring researchers, hiring oceanographers to prove that Narvaez actually landed in St. Petersburg um, and used science to do so. Um, the problem is they never found anything that proved that he landed there. I mean, we knew that we know he landed somewhere between Tampa Bay, maybe Tarpon Springs, who knows? Um, but that nothing, there's no definitive proof that he landed there. So that that's the fun part of history, right? And from that point forward, Florida changes. We change. St. Petersburg changes. Um, you know, whether we were Spanish or British during those periods, um, through the pioneer life. But we're going to fast forward to the 1800s. Um, St. Petersburg, like Clearwater, during this time period were, was orange trees, cattle, timber, pretty much, and other agricultural things, fishing, right? Um, a gentleman by the name of General John Williams on the left there with the great beard before he wasn't even a craft beer brewer. He had this awesome beard, right? Um, he, uh, he purchased a bunch of land in St. Petersburg in the late 1800s. Well, actually, it was called Point Pinellas then. Um, or Paul's Landing, or it had a bunch of other names. It was whoever decided to buy a piece of property called the town after themselves. Uh, and he purchased a bunch of land there, tried farming, didn't work. He came from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, he tried farming northern crops. Of course, we know we have sand for soil. You know, it didn't work. Um, and then he heard about this crazy Russian on the right, Peter Demens, who owned the Orange Belt Railway. And Demens was negotiating with Hamilton Distant to take the railroad to Distant City, which is now Gulfport. Uh, and Williams meets with Demens and gives him a deal he can't refuse, gave him a tremendous amount of land to take that railroad and had it to turn west or left and end up in what is now downtown St. Petersburg. So a lot, of, a lot of people, these are the two founding fathers of the city of St. Petersburg as it stands today. And we always ask this question about how we got our name or how St. Petersburg got its name. 
um, there's a, you know, if you, you take some of these trolley tours and stuff, there's this, there's this story that's kind of fun that these two guys stood on this sandy road, which is now Central Avenue, and flipped a coin. And the winner gets the name, you know, the city. The loser gets the name, the first hotel. So the story goes, you know, Peter Men's flipped the, you know, they flipped the coin. Peter wins. He names it St. Petersburg after St. Petersburg, Russia, where he was from. Uh, and then John Williams gets the name of the hotel, the Detroit Hotel, from where he was from. Um, so it's kind of fun to envision them in the middle of Central Avenue doing that, flipping a coin, but it, it didn't quite happen that way. You know, truth is never as fun as stories that become truth, I guess, along the way, if you tell them enough times. Um, the, the company that brought the railroad here and the land company was made up of a bunch of different people. Like one guy's name was Sweet Apple. That doesn't make sense. We don't grow any apples here, right? So we couldn't name it after them. Williams wanted to call it Williamsville. We were going to be Williamsville, Florida. Um, that's really sexy for advertising and stuff like that. Um, and eventually uh, the partners got together and said, we, you know, Peter's been trying to name Florida towns after St. Petersburg up and down the coast, um, and, and finally they agreed uh, to call it St. Petersburg, much to the dismay of General Williams, who owned all the land um, along the way. So that, that's pretty much how we got our name. Here's a shot of the actual train that came in. She was called the Maddie. And actually, in the very background, you can see the Detroit Hotel there, um, which still stands today. Uh, the, the railroad came on June 8th, 1888. So imagine the people in, this, in the town at that time, the few hundred people that were here at that time, um, and the arrival of the, of, of the Maddie, she arrives, which is now like Second Street and Central Avenue, that area where the first um, train station was. And, you know, here she comes, she comes to a stop, you know, every, everybody in the town is there, the waving flags, and everybody's all excited because train means prosperity, right, when it arrives. So the, the conductor puts the little steps outside and out walks the only passenger on the train, a shoe salesman from Savannah, Georgia, and pretty much looks around and gets on the train the next day and leaves. Um, but, you know, we... we persevered and you know the the city started to grow along you know with the arrival of the train and the people that came down here along the way so this gives us a great map uh, and this fast forwards about fast forward about 20 years um, to the entire city of St. Petersburg and, and if you're familiar with the St. Pete pretty much that's about um, so we're talking second like maybe fifth or sixth no it's sixth avenue north um, taking you down to about 7th or 8th Avenue South um, and from the water to what is now about 16th Street. So that was the entire city, right? And right in the middle, you see a thing that says Reservoir. That was our water source. It was known as Reservoir Lake. It's now called Mirror Lake in the middle of, of downtown. Um, but you can look at some of the things on the right along the water. The little boxes, if you can read them, they say water lot with their number. The street that goes along the water is Beach Drive. So that's where you know, the, the, the condo towers are and the restaurants are right now. But what's missing on that map are the park systems, the land where the Vinoy Hotel is, because that didn't exist. Beach Drive is called Beach Drive because the water went up to Beach Drive. So the rest of that land was eventually filled. It was dredged and, and filled. Um, and that's why I, I, I keep preaching that you know we're a fake city because we just started creating land to build things everywhere uh, along as we went. This is a great shot. The dirt road in the middle of Central Avenue. So you're looking west. Um, the Paxson House was one of the first hotels that was built. You can see the tower of the Detroit Hotel there on the right. Um, and then I don't know if the pointer will work on this. Let's see. No, it doesn't. It's a TV screen. But you can look over here. Outhouses. Right? So we didn't have indoor plumbing yet at, at, at this time. So that's a great view of uh, what is now downtown St. Petersburg. Um, so of all those buildings, um, probably the only one that still exists is, is the actual Detroit Hotel, uh, which is a condo right now, actually. This is as the city starts to grow a little bit. This is the early 1900s, and you can see that smokestack putting that wonderful pollution from coal into the air on our waterfront so one of the thing that, one of the things our city is famous for today is our park system right our, our waterfront park system and the whole city park system but especially our waterfront park system um, is the third longest continuous park system in the United States and most city charters city charters are basically the city's constitutions that talk about how the city is run 
And most city charters, when you open them up, the first article talks about the actual forms of government, you know, whether you have a strong mayor or a city council, that type of thing. When you open up the city charter of St. Petersburg, the very first thing that you read is the protection of the parks, that nobody can build on the parks, the waterfront park system um, around the city. And it's still, and this is, you know, this is over 100 years the city's been doing this, and it's still the city's um, object, objective as as a, and it's not just downtown, it's anywhere uh, along the peninsula, of the southern peninsula of Pinellas County on St. Pete land. If a piece of land becomes available, the city buys it and turns it into a park um, uh, along the waterfront. So that smokestack you see is our first um, power station. It's where we, where uh, F.A. Davis built the the power station and brought electricity to St. Petersburg for the first time and people thought he was crazy and he almost lost his entire fortune the first year because even though he was producing electricity nobody bought it because nobody had any electric lights or anything electric in their house so it took him a while to uh, uh, to recoup some of his money there but it kind of shows you that you know the growth of the city there 1914 it's a huge year for St. Petersburg um, two things happened uh, that put us on the map internationally and throughout the rest of the country. The first thing on January 1st, 1914, is the flight of the Benoit. Um, Percival Fanzler was a businessman from Jacksonville who was at an air show and saw these planes flying and came up with an idea of, hey, why can't we fly a plane from point A to point B on a schedule like a train and actually transfer things or people? And we tried selling this idea. People looked at him like he was crazy. They're like, why would you put somebody like that in the air when you have a perfectly good train right, to ride on? And he went to Tampa and he pitched the idea of an airline that there had never been an airline, so no one knew what the heck he was talking about. Um, and he pitched the idea of an airboat system that would go from Tampa to St. Petersburg making round trip flights, taking mail, cargo, people. The city of Tampa, uh, they couldn't say no fast enough. Um, the last thing they were going to do is lose more tourists to the city of St. Petersburg and to Pinellas County. Um, so that wasn't going to happen. So he took the nearly seven-hour train ride from Tampa to St. Petersburg to connect those two cities at that time. The train was anywhere from six to seven hours, and there were actually some points of the train route where you could get out. People would get out and walk, because it was the, they were walking faster than the train was moving. Um, or you could take the seven to eight hour drive it took you to drive to Tampa from St. Petersburg, or the hour and a half to two hour steamship ride to get there. He calculated that the plane would be able to fly in 22 minutes, um, you know, obviously cutting you know, hours off the, the trip. So when he came to St. Petersburg, by this time we were already starting to build ourselves as a tourist destination. Um, and uh, when he came to St. Pete, he didn't even finish the first sentence about what he wanted to do. And everybody was like, yep, we're in, how much? Right? Because they were doing everything they could to bring people to the city. Uh, so he, the city gave them the land, they built the hangar, right? They shipped down the planes. Roger uh, and Tony Janis came and they uh, built the planes there in the hangar. On January 1st, um, Tony Janis took AC File, the former mayor of the city, on the very first commercial air flight in history. Uh, and it made huge history, uh, huge um, publicity actually all over the world because anything with aviation then was just, everybody was crazed. They wanted to know more and see more and hear more about it. Um, so the airline lasted for a few months that it was scheduled for uh, and actually traveled back and forth every day. There's only two days I think it didn't fly because of weather and they were revamping the engines. Um, they brought more planes in. The contract ran out, the tourist season was over. They needed more money to run the airline. The city said, nah, we're good, thanks. We'll see you next tourist season, right? Uh, so eventually the Janus boys left. Now, people, when we talk about aviation, of course the Wright brothers are what everybody's talking about, um, but there's two things that happened that would have made people forget about the Wright brothers and you'd be talking about the Janus boys and the Benoit airboat line the entire time. First of all um, was the, the federal lawsuit that the Wright brothers had with uh, that kept their name in, in um, the media for a while. But most importantly is everybody involved in this entire Benoit venture was dead by the end of World War I. Um, Tony Janus uh, left uh, Thomas Benoit in the airboat line to join Curtis Airplane and he was teaching Russian pilots how to fly. 
uh, in Russia when he crashed into the Black Sea and they never recovered his body. Roger Janus uh, uh, was actually, Roger Janus figured out how to, I don't know a lot about aviation, but Roger Janus figured out how to restart an engine because an engine, go, a plane goes into a dive, it stalls. So he figured out how to restart the engine. So he's teaching pilots how to do that and then crashed and died as well. Thomas Benoit, the gentleman who owned the airline company um, and owned the, the, you know, the patent on the planes, he had just negotiated a deal with uh, the US Army to sell hundreds of his planes that they were, they were gonna use in Europe during World War I. Um, and actually the, the uh, folks from the, the War Department were going to his office in Sandusky to actually sign the, the deal, the contract. Um, Benoit had a horrible habit of jumping on and off moving trolley cars. Um, and then when he jumped off one of the trolley cars, he ran headfirst into a pole um, and died a few days later. Um, so everybody involved in this intervention intervention was gone by, by uh, 1917. So it, it, it kind of changed aviation history. And they, they kind of were forgotten until uh, the late 50s, early 60s, when everybody realized that, hey, these are the guys that created airlines and scheduled flight and stuff like that. So their notoriety started to return. 1914 was also the birth of spring training. Now, Tampa claims they had the first spring training season, which is not true. They had a few games. We actually had the first season of spring training. Um, Al Lang, uh, a, a businessman who moved down from Pittsburgh, uh, convinced the St. Louis Browns to come to St. Petersburg in 1914. And from that point forward, all the teams started coming down to the city. Uh, we provided them you know, hotel space and we were building fields on the train. And of course, you were in Florida in March compared to the Carolinas or New Jersey you know, or Virginia training. Uh, so, but we, we basically um, made it big time in 1924 when the Yankees decided to come to St. Petersburg. So there's Babe Ruth at Crescent Lake and you can see all the, you know, the, the cameras in the background. So the, you know, the newsreels, everywhere Babe Ruth went, they were filming him, the reporters were here. Um, so y you couldn't, how much would it cost to pay for that advertising when you picked up a newspaper in Philly or New York or Boston or Baltimore and, you know, the dateline was St. Petersburg, Florida and the pictures were games at, you know, eventually Allang Field at the Waterfront Park in St. Petersburg, Florida. So it was well worth um, the investment to, to build those stadiums down in, in, in that time. So spring training, and if you were here during the spring training days, I mean, Clearwater obviously still has it, but in St. Pete growing up, I remember, I mean, we, my, I remember my first job downtown was, I was working for the Festival of States and helping the city promote different events downtown. Um, and then leaving, you know, work at lunch to go to the one o'clock game at Al Lang and then thinking, okay, it's like 2.30 and I'm still sitting here in the stands, how much trouble I'm gonna be. And then you see your boss like four rows down in the stands, you know, so spring training was a magical time uh, in St. Pete, especially when you had eight teams there. And we had eight teams there at, at one time. Um, we've had a long history of peers and there's always been these fights recently over the peers and what they look like and what they're supposed to do. And has anyone been to the new St. Pete Pier? It's spectacular. Um, they got it right. I mean, the, the stuff that's on the land actually is amazing before you even get out to the water. Yes, sir. That's my museum. Can't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, we lived behind a fence for two and a half years. Uh, the, the day the pier opened, I looked out the front door and said, I don't recognize this without a big old construction fence you know, in front of us. Um, but this is my favorite pier, uh, just because it's ridiculous. Um, a gentleman by the name of Edwin Tomlinson who made a fortune in the drilling industry, moved to St. Petersburg, bought a bunch of land, and, and including waterfront land. And back then, you didn't have to worry about Coast Guard or Army Corps of Engineers, you just built a pier. You know, you own the land underneath the water, so it was yours, so you just built a pier. So he built this long old pier into Tampa Bay, and you can see a little house at the end of it. He built a house on it so he could sit in that house and he drilled holes in the floorboard so he could just drop his line in and fish in comfort, right? There, so he wouldn't have to be worrying about in the sun, he'd be in his rocking chair fishing. Um, they saw, St. Petersburg used to have a lot of, uh, natural springs bubbling up everywhere. And there was one there downtown. Um, they ended up uh, cap or they ended up drilling, bringing the water out on, uh, onto the land and it smelled awful. And we all know what you know, the sulfur water and sprinklers smell like and stuff like that. It was a million times worse. The Times had an article um, saying, 
equating it to the smell of like a dozen eggs rotting on a St. Pete sidewalk in August. Um, I can't even imagine that, you know, but the townspeople were not happy with this because you could smell it all, all over town. Um, and during this time period, everything starts happening at this right time for this situation because there was an article that was written that claimed that St. Petersburg was the healthiest place on the planet, that if you came here and swam in the waters of Tampa Bay or the Gulf and hung out in the sun, whatever you ailed, whether it was cancer or arthritis, would be gone because it's magic, right? And uh, he sold the land where the, where the pier is, uh, but someone actually drank the water and they felt great. And then other people drank the water. I mean, I, first of all, you, how brave were you to drink this water that smelled as bad as it did? And people started you know, coming from all over to bottle the water and take it home and their jugs and stuff. And, and then finally someone said, what, what's up with this water, right? So they tested it and it had an unbelievable high amount of lithium in it. So of course people were feeling better. It was happy water, right? They were getting stoned when they were drinking this water. Um, so the, the well was capped. Um, and it becomes known, and basically it was, this was our first tourist attraction, because it was billed as, you know, what Juan Ponce de Leon came looking for, we found in St. Petersburg, right? Um, so the well was capped and a potable well was, you know, potable water well was drilled, and the, the Fountain of Youth is still there. It's in its third location, but it's still sitting there outside of Al Lang Stadium um, that you can go drink the water from if you wish um, and see how long you live. You, you know the, the Fountain of Youth story with Juan is a lie, right? It's not true. He never came looking for the Fountain of Youth. He came looking for gold like everybody else did and to settle Florida. The whole thing was a lie made up by a different conquistador who was mad that Juan got to come to Florida twice before he got to come here. So he made it up that Juan was just, you know, wasting the king's money and that type of stuff. So, 1921. Yes, sir. It looks like it probably decorative, yes. It, 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 they probably wanted to make it look kind of creepy. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, this is a shot of the waterfront in 1921. So back then, the hurricanes didn't have names. It was just known as you know the October storm of 1921. Um, it was a direct hit on the city. Uh, it was not a relatively strong hurricane, but it was still a hurricane force. They hit us, and, and it destroyed. Back then, there were we had I think four or five piers at one time. Just I mean, it took us five years to get one, right? But they they had like four or five of them out there. They were all wooden, and we had a municipal pier on the same Second Avenue route that the new pier stands on today. But again, it was wooden as well. So when the storm of eighteen or the storm of nineteen twenty one hit, um, it flooded all of downtown, nearly up to Fourth Street. Um, so that gives you an idea of what would happen if a Category 4 or 5 would actually strike. Uh, uh, so we, we've been pretty lucky with that. But it did rip up everything along the waterfront. That was the municipal pier um, that no longer stood after that. And this is when um, they uh, uh, decided to build a new pier out of concrete um, rather, rather than wood. But in perfect St. Petersburg fashion, right, when the media heard about the hurricane hitting, and of course by now the people up north knew of St. Petersburg because of spring training and because of tourism, of course they, you know, they were sending wires wanting to know, oh my gosh, did you survive? How was it? And of course the mayor of St. Pete, Noel Mitchell at the time said, oh, we escaped virtually unscathed. Come on down and bring your money, right? And that was just the way St. Pete ran. Um, and we also created whatever we wanted to back then. So if you're familiar with St. Petersburg, there's a little island in the southeast part of the city called Coquina Key. It's a residential island. It was never an island. It was a peninsula. The guy who owned it decided he wanted more waterfront land, so he dredged right through the land and created a channel and built Coquina Key. Um, this is the stuff that they used to do in the 20s um, throughout, not just St. Petersburg, but throughout, you know, throughout most of Florida along the way. We had a number of developers come through our city as they did up in the northern part of the county, none bigger than um, C. Perry Snell, Commodore Perry Snell. Um, who created this island after himself, Snell Isle. So this gives you an idea of when he wanted to turn St. Petersburg, he loved Europe, Venice especially, wanted to turn us into the Venice of, of uh, the United States. And um, he built magnificent Spanish or Re Mediterranean Revival homes, um, big wide boulevards. So this was the beginning of Snell Isle. And the very first thing he built 
was the country club and the golf course because he wanted to sell this to the rich and famous up north. This was not going to be a working class neighborhood. This is where we're going to be where the DuPonts and his pal, the Rockefellers, and all these guys would come down here and live for three or four months out of the winter and then go back up north um, along the way. This is my favorite mayor, uh, except for our current one. Um, his name is Frank Fortune Pulver, and he was known as the millionaire bachelor mayor. Um, and uh, smoke and mirrors, and that's what I like to tell my students, that the city was built on smoke and mirrors. Um, Pulver, uh, while he was mayor, the city of St. Petersburg had a PR director, a public relations person. No other city in America had one. Right? So we hired this PR guy, and this PR guy loved the ladies, and he loved showing off the beaches and ladies on the beaches. So he came up with the idea to put Pulver in his you know, famous white suit, white shoes, girls on his arms, and they would go to places like Atlantic City, or they would go to New York, or Chicago, or Philly, and they'd hand out brochures of St. Petersburg. So all these businessmen would be coming out of their office and see these, you know, barely dressed young ladies the 1920s right and you know it was the middle of winter they were in their bathing suits and they were handing out brochures and of course they were like oh I gotta go to St. Pete right and that's how our whole you know beach sun fun thing started um, and just a quick story about that the PR um, the PR department in the city then was brilliant because it, it all of a sudden this thing happened in the media about sea vamps that the St. Pete Christian League, um, a new organization that was formed, was formed to fight this because they claimed that these sea vamps was going to destroy the moral fiber of St. Petersburg. So this became this huge battle and they requested that the police department actually go to Spa Beach and measure their bathing suits to make sure that they were legal. So of course, Frank Pulver was like, I volunteer. And you know, he went down there and did it and of course had nobody fined or arrested because he was good with all of them, you know? And this, this made national news, this battle between you know, the Christian Association and the, you know, the sea vamps. And um, next thing you know, we had to come clean. The whole thing was made up. We just made the whole thing up just to get national publicity about the St. Petersburg. And it worked, right, along the way. Um, now, in the 1920s, um, St. Pete, and St. Pete, you know, over the years, I mean, like I said, I grew up in St. Pete, so I remember the retirement era of the city. And um, a lot of people in the modern era just remember St. Pete as God's waiting room, right, or the retirement city that it was. In the 1920s, we were, we were Vegas before anybody thought of Vegas, right? It was the middle of Prohibition. We had booze everywhere. We had nude sunbathing on Spot Beach. There was gambling everywhere. There was dancing, partying. We were the place to go when you wanted to have a good time, and nobody really cared because our hotels were filled. The restaurants were filled. The bars were filled, right, even, even during Prohibition. But this is the solarium um, at Spa Beach. But it wasn't nude sunbathing. It was heliotherapy. Because if you laid out in the sun, it was good for you, right? And it cured things because it made your body, you know, build vitamin D. So this gigantic wall, you know, separated the men's side and the women's side. And of course, they have towels on them because they're being photographed. But they would be out there for 20 minutes and flip over for another 20 minutes. And you'd pay, you know, your money to had your own little locker. And it was incredibly popular. Right? and safe, except for the pilots that would fly into Albert Wooded Airport and change their route so they could fly over to have a peek at the women um, that were there. You know, boys will always be boys. Um, so this is another story about St. Pete that we love to talk about. Um, can you recognize the man in the middle? Al Capone. Al Capone, right? But Al Capone coming to St. Petersburg. Well, we know that he did. He loved this area. Um, there are, you know, people, is anybody here a realtor? No, been a realtor. So if you believe the realtors in St. Petersburg, he lived in every house in St. Pete that they're trying to sell, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, everywhere. Shore Acres, you name it. He did come here a lot. He used to like to stay. He stayed at the Don Cesar quite a bit, obviously. Uh, he actually rented the, the top floor of it when he stayed there. There were homes built in the city for his mother, allegedly, um, and she never ended up living there. So his girlfriend turned it into our first bordello. Um, and then there were other homes for his lieutenants along the way. Um, but he was known to hang out quite a bit in St. Pete. Um, he did own a house in Miami Beach when he left Chicago. 
Uh, he, he did, you know, his residence was Miami Beach. Um, but we have an area on the west side of town right at that spot where allegedly Panfilo Narvaez landed in 1528. Um, and he partnered with a guy by the name of Walter Fuller, another developer, to build our first real nightclub called the Gangplank Lounge, way out on Park Street that was impossible to reach, and except by trolley or boat, right, when it first opened. And a trolley, you could hear coming, you know, electric trolley, you heard a mile away, so you had plenty of time to hide all the gambling machines and the booze during Prohibition. Um, but uh, the story goes is that um, we were the conduit of rum for the United States that would come in through... Uh, you know, Cuban rum that would come in in bigger boats, transfer to smaller boats. They were faster little boats that would evade the Coast Guard cutters, make their way to that dock area where a tunnel was actually found that led from the dock area to inside where the restaurant is. So the rum was transported from there, and then um, it was finished, labeled, bottled, and then moved to a little airfield or airstrip, actually, that was just cut out of the middle of the woods by Walter Fuller um, so planes could take the rum on its way. Right now, it's where Tyrone Square Mall is, but that the, in that area. Uh, but that's where uh, eventually Fuller Piper Field, an airport, was actually built there. But in the beginning, um, the story goes that's how uh, we supplied the country with rum along the way. This is my one of my favorite buildings in the city. It still stands today. Um, Perry Snell built it in 1926. The thing that's really cool about this building is, first of all, it has a full-size basement, and that's rare anywhere in Florida along the coastline. Uh, when it opened, the basement was a restaurant. And if you walk along the sidewalks around the Snell building today, you see glass blocks in the sidewalk. They weren't put there in the 80s when people were doing that to their homes. It, it, they were, they're original. And because it, what it would do is at night when the restaurant would turn its lights on, the light would come through the glass blocks and illuminate the sidewalk. So it was just light coming out around the building the entire time. The building also has... Um, a rooftop terrace. You can see like the little trees there. So behind the actual tower is a rooftop terrace. There used to be a place there called Spanish Bob's in the 1920s. That was a bar, 1920s, prohibition. That's a problem, right? Except in St. Pete, because you have to, get, still today, to go up to that area, the elevator, which is the original elevator, you have to have a key to actually put in. So it was the easy, it was the best speakeasy ever, right? You had to have a key, except you were on a rooftop. So dancing, music, people partying, you could hear them throughout downtown St. Pete, but nobody could figure out. But again, we didn't care. We wanted people to come down here and play and have a good time and enjoy themselves um, you know, during that, that time period. It was at the time when it was built the tallest building in St. Petersburg. Um, so like I said, it still stands today. And actually the top part um, is a, uh, a condo. Um, the, t the whole top part of this building are, are living spaces. That condo came for sale. And when it came for sale, I looked at my wife, I'm like, okay, I get to live in Paris Dallas condo, we're buying this thing, right? And then of course, she's like, um, where are you gonna park? How are you gonna carry your groceries? What do you get? I mean, because the, you have to park at a parking garage two blocks away and carry everything up to. I'm like, oh, I hate when people are reasonable, you know? I just wanted to live in Perry's Nell's condo um, along the way, but it's a magnificent building. Okay, so here's the last um, tale. Does anybody recognize this? So it's St. Mary's Catholic Church, which is on 4th Street and 5th Avenue South. Do you recognize this? Yes, it's called Comfort Station Number 1, or if you've grown up in St. Pete, Little St. Mary's, right? Because it looks like this. So the story goes, again, if you're you know, riding a trolley, they're going to tell you that the builders that were building St. Mary's Catholic Church, when they were finished with it, were stiffed for the last payment by the Catholic Church. They refused to send them their last payment. So to get even with the Catholic Church, they built the city's first public bathroom to resemble the church, right? Which is kind of like a you know, fun, get even kind of story, but it's not true, um, unfortunately. This building was built two years before the church. Same architect, same builder, same everything um, uh, along the way. That didn't get paid? Probably, probably along the way. But yeah, we, this, I think this was built in 27 in the church in 29, if I'm not mistaken, um, along the way. So what changes our area? And this affected Clearwater as much as it affected St. Petersburg. Um, Florida, had, Florida was the least populated state in the South prior to World War II. I mean, Alabama had more people than we did, right? World War II changes that. Um, 
Florida was, uh, the, the Great Depression hurt us tremendously. Um, but you've got to remember that the people that were extremely wealthy up north that would travel to Florida for the winter still had money and still traveled to Florida. Um, what really hurt us was the beginning of the war. Uh, because when World War II started and everybody went, you know, the Depression ends and people go to work in factories 24 hours a day and everybody's thinking we all have money now, we opened our doors to these folks and the hotels were empty and the restaurants were empty because you, even if you had money, you couldn't get to Florida. Trains were rerouted to move troops. Gas was rationed. You couldn't get a ship here. There was no way to get here. So we were dying um, economically. Uh, in the state of Florida. So the governor and a bunch of the politicians met with the War Department and said, listen, you have to build a 10 million man army. It's going to cost you a fortune to build training camps. We have what you need. We have hundreds of thousands of empty hotel rooms. We have restaurants. We have cafeterias. We have hundreds of miles of beach for you to practice amphibious landing. So basically, Florida becomes one gigantic military training camp um, for the war from 1942 on. And including St. Petersburg. We had the Army Air Corps come to the city. We had about 100,000 soldiers come through St. Petersburg. Um, they took over every single hotel except for one. The Swanee remained open to the public. Everything else was you know, leased by the military. Um, the Army took the Don Cesar on the beach and turned that into a hospital. Um, and they trained everywhere. This is out somewhere near Park Street in the western part of the city. Um, Albert Whitted Airport was filled with fighter planes, so uh, the fighter pilots would fly out of there, the bomber pilots out of McDill Field and St. Pete Clearwood Airport. Um, and a lot of soldiers, especially the officers who came here, their families came with them. And I'm getting more and more stories of people who would rent their homes. Either I was in one house in Snell Isle, actually, where they literally just cut the house in half and put like fake walls up where they'd rent it to a, a, a wife and her kids while the husband was out fighting the war. Um, so a lot of these families came here. A lot of soldiers came here and trained. Um, so imagine being a pilot, right? You're a crop dusting pilot in Iowa or someplace like that where it's freezing cold in the wintertime. And you're here in St. Petersburg, you know, in February, January, March, when it's 75 degrees and it's beautiful and you're on a spot beach drinking a beer. And then, you know, you survive the war, you go home and it's 17 degrees on your family farm. How long do you think they were going to stay there? They were just sitting there thinking about their time in St. Pete and they moved back by the thousands. And a lot of the soldiers who came here and who families stayed here when they returned back from the war just stayed here. So um, in our archives we have, that's open to the public, we have city directories, you know, dating back to 1918, I think. But if you look at the city directories, which are the old fashioned, you know, phone books that were way more intense, which includes businesses and property, that whole thing. 1939 is probably maybe two inches, two and a half inches thick, right? 1949 is like this. All right, so the number of people who came here. World War II changed Florida almost more than anything except the Spanish arriving um, along the way. That and air conditioning and DDT. Okay, so I have to, no one believes me. I have to ask this question. So if you grew up here, did you like ride your bike behind the DDT fog trucks? In the fog. Of course, right? I tried telling this guy spraying my yard. And I'm telling him this story and he's like, you'd be dead. I'm like, no, we would love that in the summer. We'd just start chasing the trucks on our bicycles and stuff, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so DDT and air conditioning made us. I mean, once, once uh, the carrier company, in, you know, introduced the, the home air conditioning unit that you put in the window that sounded like three people banging on pots and pans and it was on and sucked up more electricity than you can imagine, right? But it turned your house to 72 degrees. I mean, once that happened, the floodgates opened and, you know, Florida became a year-round destination. 1956, the king comes to St. Petersburg. Um, I just finished reading a book uh, by an author who talked about Elvis's start in the music industry. And basically, Florida created Elvis Presley. Um, he had more concerts here in Florida than in any other place um, along the way. And then I just I didn't know all these things about him. Like, he never performed a concert outside of the United States. Do you know why? Because Colonel Tom Parker, his manager, was an illegal immigrant. He was afraid that he wouldn't be allowed back into the country. <laughs> Crazy. I didn't know that either until I read the book. So this is the Florida Theater um, in, in, that was in downtown St. Petersburg. Elvis performed three sold-out shows there in 1956. This is just before Elvis became 
Elvis. I mean, he was pretty well known, but this is months before he exploded on the, you know, the, the, the world scene. And we had the, the author of that book I read, he was speaking at the Museum of History, and there were three ladies in the front row who like, said, we were there. We, we literally sat, we were, they were screaming in the front row during the concert as, as teenage girls. The HMS Bounty, anybody remember that? Yeah, everybody, uh, all the kids who grew up in St. Pete would wander through the Bounty one time or another. Um, and it, it make, when you kind of think about it, it makes no sense why this thing ends up, ends up in St. Petersburg, right? Um, but they, this boat was used, it was a replica of the original that was built by the same shipbuilding company um, in England. And it was used in the 1960s movie, you know, Mutiny on the Bounty. And actually, uh, the original script of the movie calls for the ship to be burned in the last scene. And Marlon Brando threatened to walk off the set if they actually did that to the boat. Um, so they brought in a balsa wood kind of looking boat and burned it down. So after the filming was completed, uh, it, it came to St. Petersburg as a tourist attraction where it sat for years and years and years and years until Ted Turner of you know, CNN fame um, purchased it. And then he, it split time between St. Petersburg and Connecticut. It would go to Connecticut in the summer and come back here in the winter and tie up at the end of the pier. Uh, on its way back, um, it in, off the coast of North Carolina, it encountered Hurricane Sandy. And the captain made the decision to take it out to sea, because that's what you do with big boats, rather than tie them up into a dock somewhere for hurricane strikes. It took on water, um, basically cracked in half, capsized, and sank um, along the way. So we lost the bounty. How many of you remember this? Oh, I do. So there's been lots of, you know, it's been in the newspaper, the media, you know, the whole argument about the piers or the pier in St. Pete. What should it look like? What should it, you know, do we need a pier? People tend to forget that the original 1926 pier that had a Mediterranean building at the end of it, that was knocked down in 1967. So until 1972, this is all that stood, which is a place where you'd go park and go fish. Um, or go look at the pelicans, you know, or, or the water. Um, so we, we've lived through some bizarre pier situations in, in, you know, in St. Petersburg along the way. I talked about our expansion. This is what it's going to look like, kind of. Um, we've already changed the artwork on the top, so that's going to be different. Um, when we open, hopefully, um, in 2021, we were supposed to start construction next week. Um, but that got pushed back because of uh, a number of things, including the pier delay of the pier opening as well as the, the, the COVID situation. So we'll probably hopefully start construction in January um, and be finished by the end of uh, 2021. What this does for us is the, uh, the part that's wrapped inside, it's a gigantic rectangular concrete building that's going to house our new permanent exhibit. Um, and I, permanent's the wrong word for it because we're going we're to change out the elements of it every three, four, five months. Um, but basically, we'll be moving all our artifacts in our, ex our St. Pete and Florida exhibit space off the floodplain to a second story room that's complete concrete. So it'll be safer when storms come. And this kind of gives you an idea of what we're, I mean, some of the elements that, that we're going to build. This thing's really cool. I don't understand technology, right? Um, this thing called the Florida Oracle, it's a big topography map of the state of Florida, and you're gonna push a button and say, I wanna know like where all the trains went, and you can wave your hand over the state of Florida, and then magically the trains will start appearing by projection on the, on the thing. I don't ask questions, I just go, yes, that's what I want, you know, in, in, in the museum. Um, but we've been around uh, for almost 100 years. Actually, the Historical Society is 100 years old, um, but the museum itself, uh, that hurricane that hit in 1921, we, uh, the very first picture you saw uh, of the museum, originally that was an aquarium building. It was a, a tourist attraction filled with aquariums. The storm of 1921 flooded that building and pretty much just, you know, took out a lot of it. Uh, the gentleman who ran the aquarium business is like, I'm done with Florida. This is crazy, these hurricane things. So he left. Uh, so Mary Wheeler Eaton, who started our historical society, um, pretty, pretty much ran the town for a long time, <laughs> um, you know, convinced uh, the mayor and city council that we needed a history museum. So uh, she took the building and they opened in uh, February of uh, 2022. Um, so I'm looking that our construction will probably get us to somewhere close to our 100th anniversary. So it's gonna be one heck of a party I'm along the way. So we, we've been there for nearly 100 years. We're the third oldest museum in Florida, and the oldest in Pinellas County. Um, and we, uh, 
we have a good time down there. And we're, we've changed our focus to being more than just the city's history. We've included a lot of Pinellas County, and now we're expanding further to tell the story of, of Florida, the history of Florida. And that's what that new exhibit will do. It'll tell Florida history as well as how St. Pete's history and Pinellas County's history related to the state of Florida. All right, you guys have any questions? Yes, ma'am. We do not have the shrunken heads. Um, that's a great question because, you know, we, we've just, uh, I put some flyers out there. We, we opened up a new exhibit called Building the Sunshine City. Um, I have a new archivist and collections manager, and she's been going through, and, okay, so you can, and you, you, I love history museums, especially old ones, and I even love, I love finding how they recorded things back in the day. So a hundred years ago, right, um, these volunteers, because the museum was all volunteer based back then, would start, you know, would look at an item and then write, and we have records that are still handwritten or typed. Um, you know, sometimes they're a little off, you know, but we, we've been going through and recataloging everything, and we have tens of thousands of pieces in our collection, um, photographing them properly, putting them in the right software, you know, so we can put the collection online. But doing that, we found amazing stuff. So we have a gallery now called the Auditorium. And in that gallery is where our mummy lives. She's a 3,000-year-old Egyptian mummy. We also have a two-headed calf that we've had since 1926 that's there as well. And um, people would just bring us stuff. I mean, and, and they would, you know, their stories of the curator opening, you know, going to open the door at the museum, and there would be boxes of stuff on the doorstep. So people are like, okay, all these folks moved to St. Pete in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and next thing you know, you know, my grandmother, maybe she passed away, and like, you're the History Museum, so here's all the old stuff, right? And they took it. Um, so we, we have found some amazing stuff. In her process of going through this to help us build this exhibit called Building the Sunshine City, and it shows the growth of the city from pioneer days to current, you know, the current towers on Beach Drive. Um, but for instance, she found we have General Custard's reading glasses, I don't know why, but we do. Um, we have President Taft's pajamas that are now framed on the wall in this room because he was a big man, and these pajamas are huge, right? Um, that's something that's relevant today. Um, they're necklaces that said, please don't kiss me, they would, that they would put on babies, you know, for pandemics and tuberculosis and stuff like that so the babies wouldn't get sick. Um, I mean, we're just, like I said, we're just finding... We, we just discovered now um, in a case that we have in the exhibit, a new, the, the Sea Breeze was the first newspaper in what is now Pinellas County. It was published in Distant City. And in this new, the third edition of this paper um, in the Sea Breeze, there's a story about a gentleman from Detroit by the name of John Williams who just purchased a tract of land called Paul's Landing and another piece of land. And so it's like welcoming him to the city. And then there's another document signed by John Williams and, and his wife, Sarah, basically giving that land to the, some of the land to the railroad to bring the train here. I didn't even know we had these things. So in those two documents is the birth of the city of St. Petersburg. Um, so we're discovering, we're still discovering all kinds of cool, amazing stuff. So no, we don't have the shrunken heads anymore, but we have a lot of cool other stuff like that um, along the way. Yes, sir. This was sort of emotional for me. Uh, <laughs> my grandfather, John Rhodes, uh, down in St. Pete, 635 4th Street North, had a funeral home. And uh, you struck a bell with me about housing the military. He took, the, he had a whole block building that was two stories, and part of it, uh, he converted to apartments for these families that he was serving. They didn't have any place to go because the hotels were full. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wait, thing. before you go further, so how are you related to Bill Rhodes? Okay. Half uncle, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, Bill and Robert are, uh, they're, the, uh, uh, they're from, uh, uh, I get this right, but it's Letha, uh, the second wife of John S. Okay. And uh, so, uh, but I have, uh, uh, on my mom's side, Lloyd Gullickson, the pro in Pasadena for many years, and out, and then out on Snell Isle. Uh, I've got a picture with him standing with Babe Ruth. Oh, wow. <laughs> and a few other people that aren't St. Pete, but uh, famous, you know, like Colette Barr and Babe Dickerson. Um, the, uh, uh, I took care of Mr. Fuller's funeral arrangements. I was oh, you did? I was in water uh, working for my dad. They had, there was a 
little story all there too, but that's not St. Pete so much. But uh, they wanted a, a rose to take care of it, and I did. Uh, now is he, are they? Is he buried here? No. I, okay. I just did the prep work in Clearwater and took him to St. Pete. He belongs in St. Pete. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and you also want to make sure to talk about what happened to uh, why Central Avenue is so wide. Uh, you know, Fuller envisioned trolleys and they did the layout and all that. It never happened all the way through like uh, he envisioned, but he provided for it. Um, that brings up a good point because we did, because um, F.A. Davis actually started the trolley system and then partnered with Fuller and sold to Fuller. Um, and they expanded the trolley service throughout the city. And it, we have photographs, and, and you know, I drive downtown every day, and I think, how the heck did they have a trolley? And you see the trolley in the middle of Central Avenue, and then there's parked cars and cars going in both directions. I'm like, people don't know how to drive down that road now. How do they do it with a trolley going down it, you know? But the other thing I have uh, uh, to add is my grandfather had more than one dinner with Al Capone. <laughs> so, I don't know what the hell Do you have some of those stories? Well, I'm going to have to work on it. I, I have, uh, I'm making some notes and I, I'll uh, get your uh, yes. information. Yes. But um, uh, I've got a few things to be writing. But I do have some documentation. I, I don't know how much it'll help that uh, Bill actually uh, gave me some stuff. He didn't want to fool with all this. He's he'd moved out to uh, where the heck it is, on the Black River or something out towards Daytona, 40 miles from Daytona. Um, but um, I, I just haven't had a chance to really see how valuable it is yet um, in that regard. So, and, and I'll donate it to you guys if you want it. Uh, we would love it. I, we'll talk. I, I, I need to know these stories. Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit selfish for a moment because it's an area of, uh, that I've investigated before. And once upon a time, I thought they were going to fund a book on it for Nellis County, but didn't happen. I'm interested in the maritime history. I grew up in Tarpon Springs at the Boya Boat Works, mm -hmm. and sitting over in the corner of the yard was a Liberty V12 engine that was used in Comet 1, 2, and 3, which were raced all around the bay. And it was, um, the Comet 1 was uh, said to be in the newspapers at the time the fastest boat in Florida. And so, yeah, a Comet 2 delaminated in the hydro, uh, hydroplane races that would be near Old Far, mm -hmm. that area. But down in St. Petersburg, where it was the big area, international, well, they said it was internationally known as being the uh, Southland Regatta. The hydroplane races, mm -hmm. as well as you know, St. Petersburg had its own uh, uh, race of sailboats from St. Petersburg to Cuba and back. Yeah, my dad and raced in that. Oh, cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. the, the, the hydroplane race was called the Southland Regatta, and it took place on Lake Megory and it, for years. I mean, it was an internationally known race. Um, I remember the year that it was halted, actually, um, because the Audubon Society discovered American bald eagle nests along the, the lake and the boats would disturb them. So the race was canceled for that year and it never came back. And it's still there. It's lake Lagoya. Yeah. 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 The kind of expanding on that just a little bit is that the maritime history of this area is also rather fascinating and had its first as well. Um, and one of the things I couldn't quite uh, get was enough of the information on the hydrofoil races in St. Petersburg uh, area. You, know, you mentioned Lake Missouri, but I've also found references to races in the Bay. There were. We have photographs of them racing around the pier. So you, I, I've seen those photographs. So you're more than welcome. Our archives at the museum is open to the public. Um, by appointment now uh, because of the, you know, the, the coronavirus situation. But um, usually during normal, you know, what it was, whatever our normal life will be after this, um, we're usually open on, on, we were open on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays to the public. So you could go there and do research because we have a lot of that stuff digitized and then we have, you know, hard, hard copies of things. Fascinated by the rumors that St. Petersburg 
uh, was also known for being a place not just for the hydroplane races, but the first fast boat, and as you mentioned, the Prohibition. Oh yeah, we had lots of fast ones. And you know, the whole maritime history of our area, it doesn't get enough credit because one of the earlier photographs I showed you of the, you know, the power plant and the downtown, we were never going to be, we were never supposed to be a tourist attraction. We were never supposed to be this big, beautiful park filled place where people, when they took the train to the water, the purpose of the train going, because that was our very first pier was the railroad pier. They wanted to turn with St. Petersburg and Tampa and using Tampa Bay, this big, beautiful, deep water protected bay. We were going to be one of the largest port areas east of Louisiana, or east of New Orleans and south of Charleston. So we were going to be a major port area that connected Central and South America to the United States. They, we were, the, the whole waterfront was filled with boat building factories, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, fishing situations. I mean, the parks, actually when uh, William Straub, who was a newspaper man who moved here from Michigan and purchased the St. Pete Times for $1,500, um, started his one-man campaign that we don't need to be Tampa. We should look more like Chicago and take advantage of the waterfront and stuff like that. Um, when he basically, you know, convinced city council into doing a land swap and putting the very first park on the waterfront, which is now straw park um a lot of the people in st pete were not happy with this because parks don't pay property tax and businesses do uh, so that was that was a, a kind of a bone of contention then they started seeing the number of tourists that started coming to enjoy the sun and the surf and the parks and that changed our whole our whole way of, of looking at the city but originally it was going to be a huge maritime area yes um was there any The shell fence that went around the house. Um, movies. Uh, there have been quite, the most famous is Cocoon. Um, I show that to my class actually to show them what St. Pete used to look like. Um, yeah, there's been a number of movies. Um, Strategic Air Command was filmed at, at uh, Albert Wooded Airport with the plane flying over and Jimmy Stewart, you know, as a baseball player before he goes to war. Um, there's been a lot of other films. I can't think of on the top of my head as well. Um, he's referring to a home that. Uh, when people started building homes in downtown St. Pete, they weren't two bedroom, one bath, or three bedroom, two bath homes with a garage. They were beautiful two story Victorian looking mansions or evolved into Mediterranean Revival looking homes. Um, this gentleman had a piece of land that he had this beautiful home on and around it he constructed a fence around the entire property made out of shells. That's why we probably don't have any shells on the beach anymore, <laughs> but um, the hurricane of 1921 took it down. Um, so th it's where, uh, I still call it Baywalk, Sundial. It's where Sundial is today. There was a, at the clubhouse we, we got, that we owned, we used, used to have our museum, we had a piece of a shell fence, two pieces of shell fence. And I think Bill may have moved it over here somewhere on the campus here. But it came from a rooming house on Laurel. And the first time I saw it, I thought, I've seen this before. It's like deja vu. And then I was going through my mother's photographs, and when they first came to Clearwater, they stayed in that rooming house. Ah, okay. It was a shell fence. <laughs> well, I saw one last time I was at Heritage Village, and you guys had Monica here last week, right? She yeah. spoke here last week. Um, when I was at Heritage Village, I saw a piece of a shell fence just sitting on the ground by the new home that they're working on. And so I called her right away. I'm like, where'd that come from? So I was hoping it came from us, but it didn't. It was a piece of property. It may have been the same, same place, actually. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, just like an observation. I'm, I'm not from uh, St. Pete. I'm from Tampa. Okay. So, I mean, I know. Well, we're glad to have you here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I crossed the DMZ just to get here. <laughs> um, the, it was uh, on the slide you showed on the Spanish Galleon or yes. the Caravel. That, it's a, I, I can understand that the Spanish flag on there, so it'd be easily be recognizable. But in essence, that's not the Spanish flag of the period. The Correct. Spanish flag of the period was the Florida flag. In other words, the, the crossbars has nothing to do with the Confederate right. battle flag, but with the Spanish flag of the 16th century, which looked almost identical to the Florida flag. That, that is correct. And that, that was the prettiest slide I could find of a ship. That's why I used it. But yes, but you... I saw, I said, that's 
No, 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 no. You, you, you are complete. And actually, that was a replica ship that sailed here from Spain. That's why it carried the other flag. But you are correct. A lot. Of, so I hear that all the time, especially in the last couple of years with the conversation of the removal of Confederate monuments and things like that. Um, someone brought up the fact that, oh my gosh, you guys need to change your flag. I'm like, why? Like, was it the Confederate flag? Like, no, it's the Spanish flag. <laughs> you know, so except it didn't have the little jagged things on the actual bars. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes, the open air post office um, that just turned a hundred a couple of years ago. Uh, the carriers, like the person who the carrier that brings our mail to the museum, still rides a bicycle. They they still have a bicycle crew that goes out of that post office delivering mail. Yeah, that's a great building too. It's a beautiful building. All right, we good. Oh, question. sure. Oh, you mentioned a, a hotel that Fuller and um, Al Capone built. It was a Park nightclub. Street. Nightclub. Okay, was that Jungle Planet? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was known as the gangplank. And actually, if you when you if you go out there on the on the back part of it, mm -hmm. and uh, I was so disappointed the last time I went out there, I, get, I didn't realize they built they built townhomes behind it. So like blocks of view of the water. Um, so if you go to the back, like their little back porch area, there's like the concrete bow of a ship like going out, and that's where they would have. We got photos or of you know like the lights lighting everywhere and people in the 20s dancing out there and stuff so that was like their outdoor patio area mm -hmm. yes sir uh, i live in blue water now let me just get that on the record uh, but before i moved to blue water i was supposed to move to st Pete, to downtown st Pete. Mm -hmm. and at the time i was looking for a place uh, i went to a building there and they assured me that the, the, the penthouse it's where Lou Gehrig and, and Lou Bay Ruth came for stage during summer training. Is there any, any um, that? So you remember what I said about realtors and um, Al Capone? <laughs> if Al Capone didn't live in the house, Babe Ruth did, right? Um, but no, but you're talking about the floor of the own apartments, and that is, that is correct. So oh, I wish I had a picture of it, but there, if you look at the building, it's like a U-shaped building, and the two front towers do not look identical because of that reason, because I didn't know this, the, the, apparently those two guys didn't like each other very much. Um, they both, one lived in one penthouse, one lived in the other, and there are stories that people would come home and in between, so imagine a U-shape and in the middle was a courtyard that you'd walk through to go into the building. So each of these, um, each of the condos in, in that building have porches, right? Have terraces. So the story goes that people would come home and Babe Ruth would be sitting in his terrace and Lou Gehrig in his and they'd be playing catch back and throwing the ball back and forth across over the courtyard. So yeah, that, that is true. Actually, Babe Ruth did own a lot. Even after he retired from baseball, he would still come here every winter. Um, he loved St. Pete. And there, there, uh, there's a, there, there are quite a few homes that he lived in. Um, I had the honor a few years ago uh, his daughter, who at that time was 95, I think, 94, 95, um, it was to celebrate the centennial of spring training baseball coming uh, to, to St. Petersburg. Um, we flew her, his daughter was flown in, and the Vinoy put her up, and we, I gave her a tour. Of, we have a, a baseball exhibit in the museum called Little Cooperstown. It's the world's largest collection of autographed baseballs. And it's, you're not just looking at autographed baseballs. It's actually the way that the exhibit is curated. It tells U.S. history from the Civil War on using baseball to tell that history. But, of course, we have a lot of Babe Ruth balls signed there. And so I had the honor of, like, giving her a tour through that and pointing out the balls. And she was telling – she hadn't been back to St. Pete since just after World War II. So she was telling me stories of the city, what it looked like during that time period. And, yeah, she confirmed that her father lived there. Um, so – Yes. Two more questions, sorry. You said you only had two last time. <laughs> I thought of it. That's okay. Uh, the first one is with the Williams Park bandstand. Is that original or has it been replaced throughout the year? That is not original. That, that, that was built, I want to say, in the 50s. Um, it's very retro 50s looking. And it's go I mean, it's gorgeous. So hopefully it'll stay there forever. And there's a story about an island about, I don't know how true this is. Park. Oh yeah. Is it named after? I heard the story that it was named after the guy who invented the big man. Is that true? Yes. Charles Roser um, made his fortune. Um, 
he had a, he had a, a confectionery factory, and he came up with a patent. He patented the way of injecting the fig into the cookie, which is, you guys like fig newtons? I love fig newtons. It's like a pie, a cake, and a cookie all in one. Um, anyway, he sold when he he sold the whole kit and caboodle to Nabisco for a million dollars. <laughs> And then came, uh, or the National Biscuit Company, as it was called back then, um, and then came of all places to St. Petersburg, and he fell in love with that area. When he built Roser Park, this is, if you're not familiar with it, it's a neighborhood just out of downtown, but at the time he built it, that was out of the city limits. So he, he created that whole neighborhood. As fast as he could build those homes, he sold them. And it's, it's our first true neighborhood and our first historical registered neighborhood. It is gorgeous. Um, the homes there are, are magnificent. Yeah, so he's the, the, the Fig Newton King. Last point for me and I'll shut up. Um, before the Sunshine Skyway, there was a ferry that went over uh, to Manatee County. Yes. And my Aunt Betty Andrews was always making sure we did things that were significant. She got us on, it was either the next to last or the last trip over. And as a little kid, about like this young lady over here, I'm looking at this thing, <laughs> sure enough, I said, what? I'm not getting on that. <laughs> but of course I went. <laughs> it was called um, the Beeline Ferry. Yep. Yeah, so if you yeah. took 4th Street all the way to where it dead ends, that's where you'd yeah. get on the ferry and take you to... Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was some train. Now, Betty Ann Rhodes was your aunt? Yep. She was the product of the first marriage John S. Rhodes had. Uh, her name was Anne Marie Beckman. I knew Betty, my time at the Times, I well, sure got to know Betty Ann. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. She's character. Oh, yeah. She taught us how to water ski. She made sure we got all our Florida stuff, more than my dad ever did. Honest. It was amazing. That's cool. Very cool. Yes, sir. If I may, uh, since we're just a uh, stone's throw from the county courthouse and the state the county, mm -hmm. uh, you might... Uh, People might enjoy hearing a little bit about when St. Petersburg uh, citizens advanced on clear order, armed and ready to uh, fight for the county seat. Well, you know why the county seat is here, right? <laughs> the county seat is here because the state legislature and the governor was really angry with St. Petersburg. Um, we, were, we were Hillsborough County, right? We were part of Hillsborough County. Um, and William Straub, who again led the whole battle for the downtown waterfront system, also led the battle for separating Pinellas and Hillsborough County. And his thought process behind this was that um, a lot of the taxes, and this is what started our hatred with Tampa, no offense. Um, and of course, I'm kidding about that, right? We love Tampa most of the time. Um, so what a lot of the businesses property owners, the taxes that were being collected here on Point Pinellas um, was going to Hillsboro, to Tampa, and none of the services were coming back. Um, so Straub led this campaign to separate the two into two separate counties and used the argument that, that if you looked at Tampa and St. Petersburg and you know, Pinellas County, we were two complete different everything. Um, Tampa was uh, a, an industrial city, a port city. Tampa was very diverse as far as immigrants um, and population. We were not. We, by this time, our, our area was either agricultural or tourism-based. Um, so we had two different things that we were looking at as far as you know, socioeconomics and everything, and, and plus you're not giving us any of our money back. So he, he pretty much, um, Straub proved that the, the pen is mightier than the sword. Because um, through his editorials and his, and he actually wrote on the front page of the paper, uh, uh, I don't know if he actually penned it, but they ran on the front page of the paper the, the uh, Declaration of Independence for Pinellas County from Hillsborough County that ran. So he pretty much forced um, Tallahassee to separate the two. And so, and, you know, to get back at St. Pete, they decided to put the county seat in Clearwater whose population was much smaller than St. Petersburg's at the time. So that, that led to the uprising. It wasn't a race to build a courthouse? No. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've lived in many places in the States, and I've always been proud because most people know more or less where Tampa is, but many people don't know where St. Pete is, but you know how that is, mm -hmm. in the, particularly in the West. So the way I always, always explained it was Tampa was to St. Petersburg, why 
Oakland is to San Francisco. Yeah. And then they understood perfectly what I was talking about because this is this is more like San Francisco, and Tampa is more like Oakland. In other words, as you said, you find a well. Tampa is industrial, a lot mm -hmm. of immigrants or whatever. Like Oakland is, uh, you know, a lot of minorities or whatever. And uh, I always thought it was a good analogy because it, it, most people then understood the difference between the two areas. And I don't think the, the whole Tampa St. Pete exists much anymore like it used to. Because um, I mean I've, li I've worked on both sides of, of the bay and um, it, it's, it used to be bad. I mean it was, you just well, might, as well, might as well put like a fence across the Howard Franklin, you know, because it was, it was really bad for a while. But I don't, I don't think that exists anymore. I think both cities work together yeah. pretty well now. I see him all the time on Beach Drive. <laughs> you know, when he came over, that was it. The that that, it. Yeah, that changed everything. Um, yes, sir. One last question. Um, was there any papers besides the St. Petersburg Times? Oh, of course. There were tons. I used to sell the Evening Independent on the, the corner in front of the open-air post office when I was a kid. Um, so there was an afternoon paper, the Evening Independent, that Times eventually purchased. Um, and Lou Brown, actually, the publisher and owner of the Evening Independent, he's the one that helped come up with the whole, you know, Sunshine City thing of our, of our, uh, our moniker of our name. Um, but there were, there were, I think, three or four papers. And we're actually, we did, we've, in our archives, that we've been recataloging, we're finding a lot of these editions of things that we didn't know we had or even existed of older newspapers that maybe had three or four editions and that was it along the way. The Tampa, yeah. Tampa Trib, Clearwater Sun, I mean there are tons. Yeah. Times. Yes, yeah. The Tampa yeah. Times was the afternoon paper back when I was a kid and the yeah. Tribune was the morning paper. Yep. I remember the day that they walked in and bought it. I told them that it was closed. <laughs> yeah, and for, I'm I'm still I still I, I don't know about you guys, but I still get the paper delivered when it gets to my house on Wednesday and Sunday. But yeah, I know it's heartbreaking because I, I, I mean, I'm still I can't read it on my phone. I, I want to hold it. Well, I know that they were. I know they had a problem getting paper. What was was the whole was one of the whole issues. Um, right. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. Hope you hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.